Hello everyone and welcome to this Guardian Live event. I am Alison Flood and this evening I'm delighted to be talking to the novelist Mick Heron. Hi Mick. Hi Alison. Hello everybody. <laughs> He is the author of 21 novels and novellas and is best known for the hugely popular Slough House thrillers. This series, featuring a group of misfit secret agents who have been exiled from MI5 headquarters, began with the best-selling Slow Horses and has since been adapted into an excellent TV series starring Gary Oldman. Mick's novels have been translated into 20 languages and have won loads of awards, including the CWA, Steel and Gold Daggers. He has been praised as a successor to John le Carre, and The New Yorker recently described him as the best spy novelist of his generation. Today, we're going to be talking about his new book, The Secret Hours, which I have here. It's just out, and it is a standalone spy novel, which centres on a disastrous MI5 mission in Cold War Berlin. So, Mick, um, before I ask my first question, I just wanted to tell uh, the audience that we're going to be talking for about 40 minutes, and we want to hear from you guys as well. So do send us your questions via the Q&A button, and we'll answer as many as we can in the last section of the event. And if you like, do include your name and where you're joining us from. Now, Mick, The Secret Hours, I thought it would be great, if you don't mind, if you could start off by reading us a little passage from the book, just to get us in the mood. I'll do that. So I shall read willing. right from the opening paragraph. Brilliant. Here we go. The worst smell in the world is dead badger. He'd encountered it on his morning walk down a green lane, had caught the odour without seeing the corpse, but had guessed what it was before returning later with a shovel. Whether they all smelled that bad, or whether this one had expired of noxious causes, he didn't know. As it turned out, he couldn't do anything about it either. The creature had crawled into a tangled nest of roots to die, and it would require heavy machinery and a strong stomach to recover it. Lacking the former, and not wanting to put the latter to the test, Max opted for a third way. He'd walk a different route for a while and see if one of the local farmers shifted it in the meantime. Which was why he wasn't sure the badger would still be there a couple of nights later when he was running for his life. Amazing. I wanted to start uh, chatting, Mick, where you start, with the dead badger, which you describe as the worst smell in the world and which Max uses to great effect while he's on the run in the Devon night. First of all, what an incredible chase scene and what an opener. Second, why on earth a dead badger? Did you come across one yourself and thought, hey, great way to start a book? <laughs> uh, thank you. Yes, I've never quite front loaded a novel this way before. I usually build up to an action scene that I decided to put it all right there on the uh, and the first 15 pages or so of this one. And uh, the dead badger, um, the dead badger is real. Thankfully, I never encountered it myself. I have a brother who lives in Devon and uh, we were out walking in, in the Green Lanes a couple of years ago. Yeah. And he remarked that the worst smell in the world was dead badger. And I thought, okay, I'm having that. <laughs> and uh, it all it all span off from there, really. This is a novel that began with the first sentence. Yeah. But no, I've yeah. never encountered it myself. I'm, I'm glad to say. Well, it is an incredible chase scene. It's like an absolute corker of an opener. And then we move we move from Max onto sort of less fast moving um, to the monochrome inquiry, which is this toothless investigation into what you describe as historical over overreaching by the intelligence services. Can you tell us all a little bit more about the inquiry? Because I'm assuming a lot of people on the call won't have read the book yet because it's only out last Thursday, right? Uh, last Thursday, that's correct. Yes, the Monochrome Inquiry is a committee set up to establish, uh, to investigate uh, overreaching, as you say, by the intelligence services. Yeah. Um, and um, it is set up by an outgoing prime minister who is essentially taking his vengeance on, a, on an intelligence service, which he believes never offered him the support he felt he deserved. Um, but the inquiry is, um, is stymied right from the word go because the uh, first desk at Regent's Park, who's a, a rather wily operator, manages to put a spoke in their wheel right from day one. So although they think they've been allowed access to all these archived materials, in fact, they're not allowed anywhere near them. So they spend the first two years of the inquiry essentially spinning their wheels, talking to witnesses who don't really know very much and who are by and large themselves just pursuing petty grievances. Yeah, sort of exercise in futility, it feels like. This seems to be where I mostly go with my novels these days, that's right, yeah. <laughs> you write that it's been, that the inquiry has been announced with less fanfare than the then PM's mini break at Peppa Pig World. And we also have reference to the PM's special advisor and interminable blogger. I love um, these knowing nods we get in your books to the horror of our own political situation. Do you have as much fun writing them as I do reading them? Um, I... Not really sure that I'd call it fun. I mean, I would, I would prefer 
and we prefer it all country was being run by people one could trust um, but as it is I do do take quite a lot of material from uh, from the headlines yeah hmm. so who, sorry might from, um, <laughs> who, are, who might we be seeing in future novels I'm not sure you've quite looked at um, Liz Truss yet yeah I don't very often write short stories so she's unlikely to crop up in the <laughs> It's fair comment. <laughs> okay, so the people that we have um, seconded to this investigation are uh, civil servants Griselda Fleet and Malcolm Kyle. They are going nowhere fast, obviously. And I love all of the absolutely hopeless witnesses they call. It's just, like I said before, an exercise in futility. Until Malcolm has a supermarket run-in. Tell us what, what happens then. What, did, what, what does he end up with at that point? That's right. It's in a supermarket that uh, Malcolm calls into on his way home while... Uh musing on the futility of his existence and doing his shopping at the same time. And uh, then he has a, an accident, a trolley crash, um, which results in a small amount of havoc in his local supermarket. Everything gets set up again. He gets his trolley back together, gets to the till and finds that somebody has left an envelope in his trolley, which contains a top secret file, which does in fact contain material that monochrome inquiry is very interested in. Mm, yeah. And this sort of leads him back to investigations and to sort of a, a dual timeline of we're in 1990s Berlin. What, why then? Why did you um, decide to, to go to then? And what, what was your research like for, for that period? Uh, I can't really remember the decision that took me there in particular. Mm. I think partly it was just that, you know, I'm a, I'm a spy novelist and sooner or later all spy novelists end up in, in Berlin, <laughs> either in the 1980s or, or 90s. Um, and this just, I mean, the, the timing was essentially due to the age of the characters involved. Uh, the character in the opening chapter, Max, who ends up being chased down the green lanes, we know that he's sort of 20 years retired or 20 years or more retired spy. In order to go back into his past to find out who he was and what he was doing. Um, I needed to pick a year that was plausible given how old he is now mm. and to have him sort of experienced enough, but um, not, uh, you know, not too young, but not too old then. So middle of the nineties seemed to be about right. So yeah. it was, essentially it was just, you know, logistics and it yeah. was um, the natural uh, era for him to end up in. And Berlin, because as I say, it's, it's, the, it's the heart of the Cold War. I mean, I'm post Cold War when I'm writing, but the wounds are still very much there. The wall is no longer there, but the scar runs right through the city. The city is reunified. Germany is reunified, but it hasn't healed yet. So, I my research suggested that this was a going to be an interesting time to write about. But the research I did was largely sort of light touch stuff. I wasn't interested in. I mean, I've been to Berlin a few times. I hadn't been to Berlin at, at that time in my life. Uh, I wasn't interested in um, you know transposing the geography or providing maps or anything like that. I wanted to know what the people were like, who would be there, what the city would smell like, what people were doing in the evenings. And um, generally the, the kind of the, the, the ambience more than anything else. And that was quite swiftly, I discovered that everything that I'd thought about it was seemed to be borne up by the, the research I was doing and that it was a city that was um, essentially having still having a party, although a lot of the party was spent by people with hangovers. Uh, there was a lot of drinking, a lot of drug taking. There was um, still a lot of a lot of spies hanging around, and I decided they would all know each other and know who each other were. And um, and a lot of young men there. Um, one of the reasons was that uh, it attracted people because essentially they were avoiding the draft. Um, and yes, a lot of um, empty buildings being used as squats and as um, impromptu nightclubs, pop-up nightclubs, and we call them now, I suppose, but I don't think that mm. phrase existed then. Yeah, a lot to get your teeth into then, once you landed on, on your period. Mm. Now, the, the Secret Hours is billed as a standalone, and it very much is, in that it stands alone as a really great thriller, but without giving without giving things away, spoiling any, anything at all, I think that there's something here for fans of, of previous books of yours to get their teeth into as well, would you say? Uh, I hope so, yes. I mean, I, when I started out on it, and as I say, when I started, all I really had was the beginning. Um, I intended it to be um, a, a complete standalone, but I very quickly found myself writing something that I've come to describe as series adjacent, in that if you read the Slam House novels, you will recognise some characters that crop up, even though they're not necessarily called by the same names. Mm. Um, and yeah, so um, Easter eggs, they call them, I think. There are there are plenty of Easter eggs to be found in, in uh, Yeah. Ends. Yeah, and did you enjoy filling in some of those gaps? 
I did. I did. It was uh, again. It was. It was not something that I had planned to do initially, but I found myself having great fun seeding them throughout the throughout the novel. Now, yeah. So it it was Max and the Badger then that, that set you off on the pathway to tell this story. That's right. Yes. Um, all I knew about him was that um, that he was a man with a past, and he was not the person he was pretending to be. Uh, yeah. Everything else just developed from there. Really, I find that. For me, planning a book is best done while I'm actually writing it. I mean, I normally have a, a fair amount of idea of where I'm going. I normally have a destination in mind, but the the small detail and the actual, you know, the the, the machinery of the plot is something that I tend to do on the page rather than, you know, on a on a, um, on a split planning sheet beforehand. Yeah. So does that mean that you sometimes end up going down dead ends or having to ditch the load? I do, I do. That's happened in uh, a couple of books where I found that I've um, not really, maybe I should have spent a bit more time thinking beforehand. Uh, but it's always, it's part of the process, you know, I never mind doing that. It's um, uh, it's the sacrifice it's worth making for the kind of organic growth that a novel can have rather than uh, working out a, a plan beforehand and simply Kind of building on a plan you know where it always yeah. seems to me that a novel can be quite inert if you over plan it I think and if you show your your working on the page um whereas something where you know you genuinely don't know something's going to happen until a page or so before it does I think you've got more chance of surprising the reader that way as well yeah I always find it astonishing when writers say that like, I didn't know what was going to happen until it happened like how, how does that work like you've got Max running off away away from the people who have invaded his house and you're just like What's going to happen next? And you just see what comes. Um, sort of. I mean, I, I generally have a vague idea, you know, when I'm beginning a chapter or a scene like that. I mean, that's essentially one scene of opening chapter. Hmm. So I sort of knew how that would work. But the small detail of it, yeah, it happens as I'm as I'm writing. But, you know, there are quite a lot of small details that went in and then got taken out again. You know, yeah. I'm in the happy position of being able to, you know, correct as many errors as possible before before you get to see it so mm. uh, you know that yeah there are a lot of blind alleys get um get bricked up and i don't go down them yeah i thought max was a really interesting character because he's been he's been out of of spookdom for de a couple of decades now right and he's sort of almost become the person that he has he has pretended to be for all of these years so when he's thrown back into this world again he's sort of he's sort of two people almost by then was that something that you wanted to dig into yeah, that notion of shifting identities is very important to this book. It's one of the reasons why um, some characters who are or might be familiar appear oh. under, under different names. They appear under work names they have uh, for the intelligence service, or they never get named at all. Um, and the, the point is made by at least one of the characters that um, the uh, the job you do is for this particular character. You know, the job she's doing is more important, more important than the person she is, and therefore she's never referred to by her own name. It's always just the, the job title. Mm. Um, so, and that 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 notion, yes, I think it's one of the attractions of um, espionage as a genre. I mean, the fictional version of it, not not the real life version of espionage. Fictional version of um, espionage appeals because of that way um, identities can change they can be taped during the, the course of a, a book I think that um, you know because we all have essentially different masks that we wear all the time we all know this you know our mask for in public and at work and with our family and when we're alone that's when we're we're really our true selves when we're on our own um, and of course the espionage um, novel offers characters who are doing precisely that you know they're taking on new identities with you know fake paperwork to back it all up and I think I used to think it was that notion of becoming somebody else that was provided the attraction uh, of, of the genre particularly but now I think it's more the idea of leaving behind who you actually are you know it's not so much the becoming a new person it's shedding the old one so there's quite a lot of that goes on in in the secret acts mm. and, and and what that does to you as a person I guess once you've once you've taken on this new identity and 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 kind of it's become who you are what what that does to who you are underneath um you're kind of exploring that as well, especially with Max, I think. Uh, that's right, yes. I mean, there are many other ways I could have gone uh, exploring that. I mean, I don't, I, I touch on it, but I don't really go very far down the uh, the route which talks about the effect it has on other people. You're pretending to be somebody else, you know, what, what damage you inflict on other people whose lives you come into contact with. Um, and we've all read about this many times over the past few years. I didn't really go down that route, but that was certainly something that was in my mind when I was 
thinking about this issue of, of um, shifting characters. Yeah. Is that something you might look at more in the future? Um, I was, about to say, I, don't, I was about to say I don't like to repeat myself when I think about the novels. I think I do repeat myself quite a lot. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe. I don't I don't really know. I haven't got um it's not that's not what I'm working on at the moment, but I certainly wouldn't rule it out in the future. Yeah, yeah. You 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 said just just before what, what you liked about espionage fiction, what kind of attracted you to it. How do you how do you kind of become a spy novelist if as I think it's the case, you are not kind of a spy to start with, and you don't have that kind of key insight into the world. Why? Why? How do you? How do you take that first step? Is it a scary one? Um, it's something that I put off for quite a while. I think. I mean, as spies had turned up a little bit in, in earlier novels, but certainly doing the first full dress spy novel, as it were, hmm. felt like it was going to be a big, a big deal, a big step to take. Until I had the notion that I could write about spies who were failures. And that seemed to make it much easier for me because then I could just write about failure. I could write about these people who weren't, hadn't done well in their careers, who had been thwarted, who were unhappy. And then immediately I have that thought. It's the characters who are foregrounded rather than the work that they're doing. And that made everything seem much, much simpler. That's a novel, you know, that's that's the kind of thing I can do. Whereas writing about the equipment I might possess and the technology that they have their hands on, yeah. I don't know any of that. It's not something I'm interested in. It's not something I would want to research. So when you know, my characters have had all that removed from them, they don't have access to any of that stuff. So that was it. It was it was making uh, this, that made it doable. Yeah, put you into my own uh, ignorance room. Yeah, yeah. Because you had written a series of detective novels beforehand, right? There are a few detective novels. Yeah, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. Just while you were working as a sub editor. Uh, well, I was working as a sub editor right up until um, I was writing London Rules, which is the fifth of the Smile House books. Right. That's when I, yeah. that's when I um, gave up work. Yeah. Yeah. How were you fitting it all in? When were you writing? I was writing for about an hour, an hour and a quarter a night, uh, coming after getting back from uh, my job. I live in Oxford. I was commuting into London. And I, mm -hmm. uh, I didn't work on the train. I thought on the train um, and I would work when I got in. I had a target of about 350 words a day. There were times when I would stop in the middle of a sentence, you know, I was quite tired. You can always, you know, the word, word checking, is, word counting is quite easy on the, on the laptop. Um, <laughs> and there were days when I'd get to 350 and just stop because it was really quite tiring. Um, and looking back on it now, I don't know how I, I managed it really, because now I get tired if I have to, you know, be in London by midday or something, you know, it just seems to me like a huge chore. Um, but we all we all just get on with whatever we're doing at the time we're doing it, don't we? It's, um, yeah. that's, how, that's how we get through our lives. So from the beginning of, of the Zoe Bowen books, were you just very, very determined that being a novelist was what, what you wanted to do? And so you were going to fit it into life, no matter how tiring it was? Um, yes, I think so. I mean, writing was just, it, it's, it felt like who I am rather than what I do. I mean, the, the jobs I've done never amounted to a career. I mean, I had good jobs. They were interesting, I mean, but they weren't, you know, leading on anywhere I wasn't going to become uh you know there wasn't a ladder there that I was climbing or anything it was a job I was doing and if I stopped doing that I would go and get another job which was essentially the same thing mm -hmm. um so yes I mean I, I pretty much sacrificed any notion of having a, a a brilliant career in order to write instead and mm -hmm. uh, if you know the, uh, my, uh, that was the, the sum total of the ambition that I had. I wanted to write and ideally publish the novels, but if I hadn't been published, I'd still be writing them, I think. I'm mm. pretty sure. And was it always going to be crime fiction? Is that just your your top genre? Uh, I was um, writing verse when I first started to be a writer, but that was mostly when I was a student and when I was um, having a kind of <laughs> lost years of unemployment after being a student. Um, then when that stopped happening, that's when I started to write prose fiction. So during my entire working life, yes, it was always as a novelist that, uh, hmm. that I was practising. Yeah. yeah. And did you find it easy to find a publisher for the first series, the, the Zoe Bones books? No, no, I was, um, <laughs> you remained unpublished for quite a, a long time. If you add up all the years I was writing and not being published, and then all the years that I was being published, but not really being read by anybody, I've got, um, you know, I've spent at least five times as long 
being, being a failure as I am of being a success. So I still self-identify as with uh, with the slow horses, really. I think that's why I continue to write about them. <laughs> you can't become too successful. We don't want you to stop writing about them. <laughs> <how I work. laughs> so um, you, you said what attracted you about spy fiction. What about Jackson Lamb? Where did he spring from? I don't really know. I've, I've been pondering this quite a lot lately because I, I get asked it a lot. I've been doing a lot of events promoting this new book. Mm. Um, I get asked about Lamb and um, I have noticed recently or remembered recently, it's been <laughs> it's been drawn to my attention recently, uh, that there was a kind of prototype Lamb character back in my very first novel down Cemetery Road, a man called Gerard Inchant, who is like Lamb, he's very crass and insensitive. Um, and like Lamb, he does it deliberately in order to provoke those people around him, um, you learn more about him, and he's far more forgivable than than uh, than Lamb is because I, I went into the character a bit more deeply than I have done with Lamb. But uh, that was there right in, in the first book, um, and he appeared in in two of those early novels, in my first and in my fifth novel. So when I went to write Slow Horses, which was my sixth book, I don't know, he just kind of pushed his way back into my mind again, except, you know, wearing a different guise and uh, being a lot more, uh, a lot less forgivable than uh, than his earlier incarnation, but essentially the same kind of character. Mm. But where yeah. it comes from, I, I don't know, except that there's a certain kind of liberation in writing an unfiltered uh, character, somebody who is can say all the things that, you know, you wouldn't dream of saying in, out loud, you know, in, in company, even though you might be thinking them. Um, Sorry, I don't mean to suggest that Lamb is saying things that we're all thinking. I don't think that at all. Uh, but what I do mean is that um, very few of us would be prepared to be quite as outrageously rude to people, even if we don't like them, um, as, as he is. I think he's hmm. rude to people he likes, in fact, but I don't really know who he likes and who he doesn't. So hmm. I'm guessing that. Do you ever find yourself having to tone him down? Does he ever go too far in your drafts or is he always... <laughs> I never, I never turn him down. I sometimes decide that um, I, I don't think of it as toning down. I sometimes think that's no, it's the wrong place to say that, or you know, this scene's gone on too long. I need to cut a few lines, that sort of thing. But um, I would never. Oh, I don't remember ever thinking, "Oh no, that's that's too far." That's too far. Okay. Yeah. And the TV series is he how you imagined he would be? Well, I don't really have a visual image of him. So uh, I was delighted when, when Gary Oldman was cast in the role and I've continued to be delighted ever since because he's doing a wonderful job. Um, oh. he's, he's, uh, he just can't take your eyes off him when he's on the screen. So I'm absolutely delighted with that. But it's not as if I have a very strong image in my mind of what Lamb should look like because I'm very much a, a verbal writer. I mean, I, I write to the, um, I write to the words on the page, you know, I'm, I'm playing around with vocabulary. That's what uh, that's what excites me when I'm writing. It's the vocabulary mm -hmm. uh, and the prose. So it's wonderful what Gary Oldman and the rest of the cast who are all fantastic. It's wonderful what they're doing uh, on the screen, but it's not as if they're, that I feel them sort of living out the pictures in my head because I don't really have pictures in my head. I have words on a page. That's interesting. Have you, have you been involved uh, with, with the show at all? Yeah, yes, I've been in the writer's room. I've been involved in the planning. I haven't written um, scripts for it, but I've been there when the, the show is being planned. Uh, I've been on set a number of times. I appear very briefly with my partner in uh, the first episode of Slow Horses. Um, so, yes, I've, I've always been made very welcome on set as well. I mean, I get uh, you know, in, included um, in a very generous way when, when they're, you know, having lunch or... or yeah. Having parties and um, I get sent presents, yeah. which is lovely. It must be very surreal seeing it out there on the screen. Something that was on the page for you. <laughs> it, it it ought to. It ought to feel more strange than it does. I mean, it feels quite separate. I mean, that's the thing. I recognise it as being you know, sort of part of my work, as it were. But it's all being done by other people and a whole raft of other talents being brought to bear on it. Uh, all of which is outside my range of ability. So it's um, it's a delight to me and I'm, I'm thrilled by it. And it's bringing people to the books, which is which is grand. But I don't feel responsible, really. I mean, there's, there's so much intervening work goes on to, to produce that on the screen that um, uh, I feel like, you know, I may be so deceived, but I didn't uh, hang around for 
20 years when I groomed an oak tree. Really. <laughs> so Jackson Lamb strolled onto the page from from previous books. You were you were ready to write about your your failed spies. How did you get to grips with the world of espionage when when you were starting? You're saying the tech and everything like that wasn't really part of it, but sort of how did you kind of immerse yourself in in that and create your own your own universe of spies? I guess. Essentially, it was just a matter of putting them in these dismal offices and, and letting them get on with it. Um, the, because the tasks that they have to do are all completely peripheral to uh, the, you know, the, the ongoing concerns of um, our, our security services and our intelligence services. Mm. All I had to do was make up really dull tasks, or what felt to me like dull tasks, but it might nevertheless have a germ of, of use in them if they, if they all panned out, which they never do. Mm. Um, so that was it, really. And then give them all a kind of past which would indicate that at one time they'd been either better at what they did or just luckier or before the fall, you know, mm -hmm. and invent this kind of big shiny palace over the hill, which was where they were all in, in exile from and just make that the, the beating heart of the intelligence service. But what yeah. I really did was look at my own experience of working for a large organisation and just apply everything I knew about that to the intelligence service. Um, so I would knew that you know there would there would be a layer of middle management which was essentially there simply to perpetuate itself, and um, that no matter what the ideals and aims of the organisation happened to be, there would always be people with their own agendas in responsible offices there. So. Mm -hmm. You know, the fact, in a, in a sense, the fact that it's the intelligence services that I'm writing about or pretending to write about is incidental to, to what it is that, um, the, you know, the, to who the people are and what they're getting up to while they're there. Yeah, it's all yeah. It's politics, a bit large, really. Yeah. So quite a different way into it than Le Carre, for example. Well, Le Carre had the advantage of knowing what he was talking about, um, but I was, I'm just kind of winging it. So, uh, yeah, quite a different approach, really. Yeah. So the first um, Slow Horses came out in 2010, but um, it didn't immediately do particularly well, did it? Tell us the story of kind of how it was found and, and kind of republished and how the series took off, I guess. Yeah, it was published in 2010. I started writing it in 2008. It was published in 2010, didn't make any big waves. Um, mm -hmm. And I was dropped by my publisher after that. They didn't want to take the second book. Um, I, at that stage, didn't particularly want them to take my second book either because I didn't think that they were doing mm -hmm. uh, doing me any favours, really. So for a couple of years, I, I did have an American publisher um, who they they um, continued to publish my work. And the second book, Dead Lions, did do critically quite well in the sense that it won an award here, it won the, the Gold Dagger. Mm. Uh, surprised a lot of people because... Nobody had ever heard of me. And the book didn't actually have a UK publisher. It was only the barest chance that they uh, that the book was eligible, in fact, for um, for the prize because it was did have a distributor here. Um, and then, yes, I think it was not long after that that um, uh, Mark Richards, the publisher at John Murray, the newly appointed publisher at John Murray, um, came along and he came across a copy of Slow Horses in a railway station, Liverpool Street, I think, a paperback, which is an American paperback. It didn't have a UK paperback. Um, and and read it on the train and, and then he approached my American publisher and asked if he could lease the UK rights. At that point I'd written the third book in the series but it hadn't been published. There was a, a several year gap between uh, Deadlines and Real Tigers um, and he came to see me and also my American publisher thought about it and said well if said to me if you want this to happen we'll go ahead and make it happen and Mark came to see me in Oxford and we talked and I thought well why not? I didn't really think anything would come of it, to be quite honest. Mm. But I said, um, I said, fine, yeah, let's let's go ahead and do that. So he published the first two novels in paperback in 2015. I think it must be in the end of 2015. Uh, and they vanished without trace, just like <laughs> the Slow Horses had the first time around, which didn't surprise me at all. But um, it didn't didn't particularly worry me. I just thought, you know, I I'd accommodated myself to the idea that I was never going to be a you know successful headline author or anything like that. Uh, but I underestimated Mark because he, somebody who thought that uh, if he liked a book, then everybody else ought to like it too. And they, he was not going to stop bothering <laughs> them until they admitted it. So he, um, he, yes, he reprinted the books 
did them again and carried out a wonderful publicity campaign by stealth, really, for, for Real Tigers. He was um, putting proof copies of the third book on desks all around London, and it was publishers' desks. It's really counterintuitive. These are the books, the proofs. Most of the proofs are going out to people who have no investment in it at all because, you know, I already had a publisher. I had an agent. It didn't matter that these books were mm. going to agents and publishers. But what it did mean was that the book got talked about and then the other two books as well, they found that people were reading this and then going to them and saying, can we have, you know, the first two in the series? Yeah. Um, so by the time Real Tigers was published, it meant that there was a, there was a buzz there, I'll say, I'll say yeah. in the industry. And it got reviewed in, in most of the newspapers, all the nationals, um, which I'd never had before. My first novel got reviewed once in the Telegraph, mm. I think it was, and that, you know, sort of 13 years previously was the only only review I'd had in a, a national paper, I think, up until that point. And mm. um, so, yeah, that was when it all started um, taking off, really. It was due to very clever campaigning on um, on John Murray's behalf. I got told a lot in the first couple of years how this was, you know, a very rare example of a, a word of mouth success, but I'm aware of how much effort goes into creating that word of mouth. It doesn't happen by accident, or not in my case, it didn't. It didn't happen just, you know, by accident, it was um, the, the ground was prepared by people who knew what they were doing. Do you, do you think that um, the audience was more receptive to this type of book at, at that point? Uh, we're all feeling like failures ourselves. The mood was more ready for for the slow horses. I was talking about this just the other day. Yes, I think I think that's very much the case. You know, a book has a, a right time, and uh, slow horses was just not right for 2010. Obviously, um, people were more receptive to it seven years later because uh, largely because of where we were as a as a nation by then yes i mean i do think of it as a sort of post-brexit book even though i wrote it many years before brexit uh, because it does have that kind of well we talked about futility before didn't we it does have that air about it um uh, and all the the things that make slough house what it is i think we were all starting to notice that in 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 government by then mm -hmm. But even so, despite this this word of mouth success, you you ploughed on um, with your day job for another two novels. Is that right? Before you gave um, it up? Yeah, yes, a, a bit. I mean, it's always quite tricky working out which novels I was writing when, because by the time a, a book is published, you know, it's normally a year after you've handed it in, and obviously I'm well into the next one by then. Yeah. Uh, but yes, I continued working until. January 2017, I was writing London Rules when I, uh, when I handed my notice in. Yeah. What, what made you brave enough to, to do it then? Did you just feel this is, this is going okay? <laughs> yeah, yes, it was um, a combination of events. I mean, obviously the, the most important one was that um, I was offered for the first time enough money to think, well, I could stop work and if it all goes wrong, I can write for two years on the amount of money I'm being offered now. And if yeah. it goes wrong, it goes badly, then I'll go back to work in two years time. Yeah. And so it was that, that that gave me the impetus to do it. But I'd, I'd hesitated for a while. I could probably have done it six months previously, maybe. Um, but I was worried about giving up that kind of active life, as it were. I mean, I was getting on a train every day, going to London, coming back. I was with people all day long. I was in London, which is what I was writing about. I was mm -hmm. observing life going on all around me. And I thought, if I give all that up and spend my entire time in a room, writing what am i going to lose what am i going to be missing out on um and so i thought what i did was in, in 2016 i took a, a sabbatical i took four four months off work i think it was four months and i'd leave um and to see how i would cope with all that to see whether it would affect yeah. me and uh, around about 11 a.m on the first day i thought yeah i, I can do this <laughs> um, i realized that there's a lot Whatever it was that I was missing out on by not being out and about and not being in London every day was more than made up for by the fact that I didn't have to get up at five o'clock in the morning. So that made a big, big change to my life. Hmm. And um, yeah, so the first thing I did when I got back from sabbatical was hand my notice in. So I worked mm -hmm. for three months, I think it was, yes, and then, and then stopped. And um, yeah, I had that when I felt it was a sort of two year cushion, but in fact, I've never had to. Never had to do another day's work since then, thankfully. What, what did it do to you as a writer going from someone who not that many people were reading to suddenly someone that 
loads and loads of people were, re were reading. Did it, did it make it harder to write? Did you suddenly feel more self-conscious because you were aware of the number of eyes on your pages? That could have easily been a danger. And I think the, the whole, the, the big advantage of the very slow burn success was the fact that I had, my habits were well ingrained by the time, you know, I had anything that I could think of as a, as a readership. Um, I knew what I was doing. I knew how I write my books. And that wasn't affected by, you know, the, the success that they started having. I was grounded enough to know that, that whatever's going on in the outer world, you know, what happens in, in my room on, on my desk when I'm writing the books, that's what matters to me. That's the important thing. And that's the part that I can control. So uh, yeah. I just carried on doing everything the way I'd always done it. Yeah. I had to make some adjustments, obviously, when I gave up work. But essentially, the, you know, the writing process remains the same. Um, mm -hmm. And when I'm working, I'm not I'm not thinking about I'm not thinking I'm writing this book to fulfill a contract or, you know, or because there are readers who want to know what happens next. I'm writing it because it's my book and that's what I do. You know, it's yeah. it's, it's, it's it's how I how I live my life. Yeah. So it's it's not affected me as much as um, I would have expected it to. On the other hand, you know, I'm, I'm not necessarily the best person to ask. Uh, <laughs> ask the readers have changed very much or not. I don't know. Yeah. And um, you, you've written quite a few um, Slow Horses books now. Do you ever start to feel a bit tired of them and think, oh, I, I might kind of bring them to an end now? Or are you still enjoying being in that world? I'm, I'm enjoying them. I mean, I've, I've taken breaks from them. This is the third, mm. The Secret House is the third standalone I've, I've written since starting. Um, the Are these the kind of like a palate cleanser type book? That's what it was intended as, yes. In fact, with The Secret Hours, I very quickly realised that I was using the same narrative voice as I do for the Slow Horses books, which is what brought it back into that world um, a lot more strongly mm -hmm. than my previous standalones had been. Um, but it's enough, enough of a break for me, I thought, to, you know, I was getting away from the, the main roster of characters that I use. Mm -hmm. um, and also, the because of the nature of the books that I'm writing, I can I can refresh my cast, you know, to use it euphemism um you know there's i'm not although i'm still writing the same series that i started on 15 years ago um i'm writing about a very different set of characters by and large you know there are some some are still there but many aren't and there are yeah. many new ones have come in more recently so um there's enough enough difference there to keep me energized for the time being well that's done so far anyway yeah yeah you said you said you found that you're writing the secret hours in the same kind of narrative voice as the so horses books the slough the slough house books sorry um is is humor very important to you as, as you're writing that kind of deadpan laconic look at the world well this is this is the voice that those books use i mean the, mm. the narrative voice is a character it's not me it's the, the you know the tone of voice is as much as a character as um maybe not as one of the named individuals in the book but as much of a character as you know slough houses and you know mm general scenarios that I use um so uh humor was was part of that it felt to me like a very like the most appropriate way of telling these stories because mm -hmm. take the humor away and I'm writing about a bunch of people working with people I don't like working with <laughs> in a place that they don't like being and it's falling down around them and their boss treats them like they're shit I mean Who's going to want to read that? You know, it's it's awful. I mean, <laughs> too too many people are living lives like that to want to you know resort to it for the sake of entertainment. So the humour is a necessary part of that. I mean, it's not just that I thought that would make it palatable for readers, although that is true. It's also that that's how these characters would survive. I mean, it's like you know, as we all know, the emergency services are the source of the the blackest kind of humour because that's how they cope with the traumas that they see and experience every day of their working lives. I mean, the characters I'm writing about aren't as traumatized as that but nevertheless they're living deeply frustrated and uh, and thwarted standard existences really and so you know humor would be the the, the crutch that they're using as much as anything else mm. and most of the humor comes from well, mm. you know, probably most of the humor comes from the way they respond to each other it comes from their mm -hmm. interaction so it's a lot of it is just them being rude to each other <laughs> which i thought was a quite natural way for people to behave in those circumstances yeah, absolutely. Now we're going to get on to audience questions in a second, but I wanted to ask mm -hmm. one more myself, which is what's next? What are you working on at the moment? Uh, I'm working on the next Slough House book. I'm writing another one now. So I'm, I'm on page six, I think. So it's a long way to go. But, so uh, as, you, as, you nice don't, back there. <laughs> as you don't plot, then you're not quite sure where you're where you're heading. Not next. a clue, I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll look forward to reading it. Um, just to say to the audience, if you want to put a question or comment forward, just use the Q&A button and include your name if you want us to read it out. So 
going to have a look at some of the many questions that have been sent in. A few people are asking a version of this, but Paul asks, are any of your characters based on real life people? Um, no, no, none of the current characters I'm writing on. There are a couple of uh, public figures whom I you know, will uh, allude to or, or likely satirise, but uh, I don't base any of the people, uh, my protagonists, as it were, I don't base any of them on them before, no. And Robert asks, are your characters intended to picture reality within the Secret Service? No, no. Um, I think that what I'm writing about is probably worlds removed from how the intelligence service actually operates. This is all fiction. What feedback have you had from people who are actually in the intelligence service about your book? The very few occasions I've had any inclination, uh, any intimation of what is felt about my books in those circles, it's always been very positive. But I suspect a lot of that is because, um, as I say, what I'm writing has nothing to do with how things really operate. So the intelligence service are probably pleased that um, that uh, audiences, you know, my, my readership is, is being distracted by complete fantasy and has no idea what's really going on. I prefer You're giving away the secrets, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Andrew asks, um, in creating Jackson Lamb, were you deliberately seeking a character who is distinctly different to the George Smiley stereotype? Um, I suppose it's hard to deny that must have been going on at some level, but I certainly didn't create him in opposition to Smiley. Um, it's just that that's the way, I know, and I talked about having you know that, that prototype character in the earlier books, that's the way he developed. And I very quickly realised that having this kind of um, unfiltered character was going to be fun for me to write. And, and one that I was able to write, I mean, this is important, uh, um, perhaps the most important thing about it at all is I, I just write the books I'm able to write. If I could write Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. If I could write Smiley People, I would. I mean, I think that those are major works of, um, of literature, certainly major works in the genre. And uh, I've never written anything to touch them. If I could do that, I would. I can do what I do. So that's why I do it. Um, but part of probably, yeah, I mean, probably some part of my mind was thinking, oh, well, this is, you know, like Smiley turned on his head. But I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I know that um, that Gary Oldman says says similar things, and he of course has played Smiley in, in Tinker Taylor, and he's played Lamb for a couple of years now. So he's given you know substantial part of his working life, you know, you know, a year at each each time around, um, to yeah. portraying these characters and uh, and embodying these characters. So he's given them a great deal of thought, and he's described Lamb as being Smiley having made a few wrong decisions earlier in life or taken a different turning. And I think he's perfectly entitled to say that, as I say, because he's more invested in the, um, in those two characters than, than anybody else who's living. And so, uh, so perhaps, you know, I think it's an interesting thing to think about, but it's not something that I ever consciously brought to the books. And, um, and it's something that I'm, you know, I'm happy for other people to speculate about, but I don't feel that I've got very much to offer in, uh, in the debate. Yeah, fair enough. Um, Christine from Wales says that she has become very fond of some of your characters, but then they are killed off by you. Are they all doomed? <laughs> uh, we are all doomed in the long run. Aren't we? No <laughs> sorry, way. Christine. No <laughs> sorry, sorry, Christine. Uh, let's see. Um, oh, this is a good one. Paula from Italy says, in your opinion, what is our fascination with characters who are losers? Um, I suppose, I mean, I've, I've always felt, and maybe this is just me, that we can, you know, more readily identify with, with losers than with, um, than with heroes. I suppose it depends on the state of our individual egos, but um, I empathise more with those who are having a hard time than I do with those for whom everything seems effortless, or at least everything seems achievable. You know, they, I'm, I'm not capable of great acts of physical daring and, uh, uh, and amazing intrepidity. Um, but I can be the kind of guy who's standing at a bus stop in the rain, wondering how he's going to get home. You know, I can write about that because I can, I can uh, empathise with that. I've been there, likely will be there again. And there's more to write about. You know, there's, the guy standing at the bus stop in the rain has all sorts of thoughts about where his life went wrong. The, you know, the guy jumping a motorbike onto the top of a train isn't really thinking about anything. He's just doing so. Yeah, sure. Now, Annie, Annie has got a good question here, which I should have asked, really. Do you see a future for Griselda or Malcolm in the Slow Horses world? Uh, I do not know. Um, the honest answer is I've got no idea. It's, um, it's only occurred to me very recently that that could happen. Um, whether it will or not, I don't yet know. 
who knows what's next on the page after all maybe they'll just pop in we don't we can't see say um sarah from stowe says that she loves roddy ho will he ever find true love <laughs> Um, Roddy Ho has has found true love. Um, unfortunately, it's it's with himself. So you know, I think that one will last. Whether whether it will ever become a threesome, we'll have to wait and see. Okay, Bob in Gloucestershire asked a question. That I think you've kind of um, answered a little already, but it's an interesting one. Writers are often given the advice to kill your darlings as they're reluctant to remove characters they've developed. You seem to have taken this advice to extremes, killing off key characters halfway through novels. Are these planned, or do they just happen on a whim as you write? They never happen on a whim, uh, as I write. No, I think that would be uh, that would be betrayal of the characters, really. If I were doing something like that simply in order to zhuzh the novel up or you know make something exciting happen, mm -hmm. I said I don't plan the novels in any great detail, but I always have plot points that I know are going to be there. These are what trigger a novel in the first place, and so there will be you know a, a series of. Events. This wasn't true of the Secret House, but it's true of all the Slime House novels. There will be. I will have a certain number of um, way stations in mind on the way to a, a destination. Uh, the route, the route that I choose, that's what I make up day to day. But the the way stations, the plot points are there right from the go, word go. And if I'm going to kill a character off, then they are always. I know that before I start writing the book. And it's not something I take lightly, and it's um, and it's something that I've I've never regretted in as much as I wouldn't change it. But I certainly do miss some characters, not because I believe in them as as real people, but because when I'm writing a character, I have access to a particular mindset, a particular set of emotions, and a particular history. And once I kill the character off, I have all that is is denied to me, so I can't write from that viewpoint or use that character's skill sets. Again, even though my characters don't necessarily have fully formed skill sets, they do necessarily they do nevertheless have certain attributes. And once the characters are gone, I can't use those anymore. So I do regret it. I do miss some characters who uh, who I have have killed, but I wouldn't I wouldn't change anything. Mm -hmm. hmm. Interesting. David from Suffolk would like to know who your influences in the spy novel genre are. I don't really know. Uh, I think the obvious ones are Le Carre and Dayton, but the reason I would um pick on them particularly as i know i was reading them when i was a teenager and i think that a writer's influences are, are generally speaking i would suggest um those books that they have read at that particular stage of their their formative years you know the teens late teens early 20s that's when you're reading books that are going straight into your into your heart as it were i mean i could i could read a, a wonderful novel tomorrow and hopefully I will, but it won't affect me the way um, reading, uh, well, go back to Tinker Tailor again, it won't affect me the way reading Tinker Tailor did when I was, you know, 17 or whatever, whatever age I was, um, because I'm, you know, just more hardened now. Uh, I don't yeah. have that kind of emotional room to take take books on board in the same way that I used to then. So all my main influences were, were probably came from that, uh, that period, and they were you know, a strange bunch. I mean, I'm as likely to be consciously aware of uh, the influence of someone like John Steinbeck uh, as I am of, you know, a, a spy writer, because I remember just being struck by the way he wrote at that age. And there are still pages for his books. I've, I've talked about this before. Um, Sweet Thursday, for instance, just contains reams of dialogue, which for me is the gold standard, you know, it's a, talk we're using a lot of characters all talking at, at once and it's moving the plot forward and it's very very funny and it's just exquisitely well done so but nobody would look at my books and, and think oh yes obviously John Steinbeck is where uh, is where he gets his uh, his, his um, ideas from uh, so you know influences I suppose on the whole influences of her for readers to spot rather than writers I think writers just do what they do and we're all doing it under the impression or, or delusion perhaps that we have found our own true individual voice which is you know ours and ours alone and in fact it will you know it will be borrowed from here and then stitched together from all sorts of other places but we won't necessarily recognize that but readers do and i'm a really former writer you know i do that with other writers as myself so um yeah i, I looked at it from both sides of the question but uh, i'm more aware of, of uh, it as a reader than i than i can be as a writer i think mm. Okay, great answer. Judith asks, um, your description of London and England reflects a certain despair about the direction of your country. Is that your view? By and large, I'm, I'm writing probably slightly more cynically than, than I actually feel, uh, but not very much more 
a few years ago, I would have said, yeah, this narrative voice is much more cynical than I am. And I think that was true up until London Rules, which was, uh, I was thinking about before in the um, month or two leading up to the referendum, but didn't start writing at all afterwards. And I think my views changed quite a lot. <laughs> um, over that period, I realized that uh, I wasn't anywhere near cynical enough because reality had just kind of outstripped me at that stage. Mm -hmm. so a few people have asked similar things. Jill had asked if Lamb's incredibly cynical perspective reflected your worldview. Um, so I guess that kind of answers that as well, really. Mostly Lamb is there for the for the wordplay. I mean, he's you know, mm -hmm. right him according to uh, the, the kind of vocabulary that um, that I enjoy playing with. He's he's very rude and caustic about things, but I like to think anyway that there's always some kind of wordplay going on in his in his diatribes and in his insults and that's what fires my imagination that's what I like playing with the narrative voice of the books which is very cynical about the state of the country as I say I, I mean I was to an extent I was putting that on in the earlier books I don't think I'm putting it on quite so much anymore because anybody who's been paid attention been paying attention to my government over the past few years is very very angry mm. Mm. I mean, this this relates to a question from another audience member who's asking the the view about the view of the politicians in the in the books, which is is pretty despairing and bitter. I'm wondering if if, if writing it is getting something out of your system. Um, it's it, I mean, it, it can't do me any harm. I don't think you know I'm venting in this way. I'm not sure that it does any good, but mm. um, I do feel that um, that. I suppose I do feel a bit better if I come up with the with a line which which I think is is funny and which is um, in one way or another you know making a, a point about how badly governed we've been over the past few years. Yeah, I mean, it makes me feel better. It doesn't make any difference. But, yeah. Mm, yeah, Antonia says, although she is a fanatical admirer of the Slough House novels, will you return to your Oxford series, or what about starting a Newcastle series? Uh, the Oxford series I've been working with a bit over the past couple of years, I suppose, because there was a um, collection of short stories published two years ago called Dolphin Junction. None of them were new stories, but they included um, four, I think, four stories about Zoe Lowe, my Oxford detective. And uh, in reading those and preparing that collection for publication, reading them for the first time in you know, more than 10 years, um, I realised I'd never really said goodbye to that character. and. In a way, I think I would I would quite like to. Whether that will be in the form of a full-length novel, I do not know and find it unlikely, but I'd like to do something. Also, Down Cemetery Road is um, in development uh, as a TV show at the moment. Okay. Whether that will happen, again, I, again, I don't know. It's still quite early days, so it's looking very, very promising. Um, and that has, has meant that these characters are, are back in, in they, have, they have my attention again in a way that they haven't done for a while. So I, the answer is, I do not know but maybe I can't see myself writing anything set in the Northeast again, because I've lived away from there for so long that, um, that it's not my, it's just not part of my emotional geography. And even mm -hmm. that's what's part of my emotional geography. I was there just last week and, and um, there's no, there's no real feeling I get that quite matches up to crossing the river time uh, heading North. It's, it's always, uh, it's always a wonderful feeling, but I don't feel, um, Although I might feel this home in the city, I don't know it anymore. I don't know its um, its actual geography anymore. I don't know the ways in which it's changed over the past uh, 30, 40 years. I mean, I can see some of them, but they're, they're you know, certainly down by um, by the quayside. It's all there to see, but uh, I don't know how it got that way. You know, I, I couldn't write about it in a knowing sort of way at all. No. Hmm. Okay, well, fair enough. Um, Anne uh, has said that she loves the little pleasures in your writing and she's quoted a few. She likes the motorbike truffled towards him and she likes the clock on his bedside silently through another minute to the floor. And she asks, has writing been part of your life from your school days? Yeah. yeah. Moments like that, I remember very well remember writing the second of those two. And uh, there are just moments when you're writing when it, it seems to come naturally. It doesn't do that all the time, but... Um, when the odd word comes to mind, when I say the odd word, I mean one that seems unusual for the context, like truffles there. Um, that's always, you know, intuition and um, and you don't search for those words. You know, they arrive, they arrive naturally in the moment. And that only happens because I've been reading all my life. 
and I know uh, I know when to to, to seize a, a gift that's offered. You know, when when a weird like that comes to mind, you just slap it down on the paper straight away. Sometimes I'll take it out the following day, think it doesn't really work at all. But when an unusual word occurs, and a word that's unusual for a context occurs, I will always put it down and then think about it afterwards. It always happens in the moment. So from your school days then, were you were you writing fiction as, as a kid or did that begin with the Zoe Bohm books? No, I wrote stories as, uh, as a child you know, and then stopped writing for a few years in kind of late teens when I think is, is when most people stop writing stories. I think we're all telling stories to ourselves up until a certain age. Some of us are much, much longer. Um, stopped writing them down for a few years, but um, thankfully returned to it. I mean, when I returned to writing, it was, as I said earlier, with, with poetry rather than mm -hmm. uh, prose, but um, that, yeah, that, that started up again and I've never, never stopped since. Okay. Uh, Linda from the US asks, how did Mick Jagger get interested in your novels? <laughs> I've no idea. I mean, I gather he's quite a big reader. Uh, I'm very glad that he had been reading, that they, they had uh, come to his attention because um, that's what meant that when he was approached by uh, the musical director, like it was of the TV show, asking whether he'd like to write lyrics and sing a song for this um, for this show, he, he was immediately on board because he, he knew the books, he knew what what the song would be about and the lyrics that he's written for it are, are you know they're not they're not generic they're they're about they're about slow house it's um, it's quite lovely to listen to i was thrilled by it absolutely thrilled very cool <laughs> uh christine from scotland uh ask if you it asks if you have a story arc for the future of the slow house books and she absolutely loves all your books oh that's very kind of her thank you uh no i i wish i did i think uh that that would be um that would be quite interesting, but I, I don't have one. I've talked a little bit about how I don't really plan that far ahead and how most of the decisions I make about the fictions that I'm writing are made in the space on the page in front of me. Um, what I do do every so often, and I did it uh, a few months ago, is go over the books again, or certainly the most recent ones, and reread them, looking for moments in those books that I can pick out and expand upon. And that... I think sometimes might give the impression that I do have something of an arc or, or some kind of plan. Um, and I don't. That just <laughs> makes me makes me look clever. Um, but it's me just do my Give it all away. Keep <laughs> 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 that secret. <laughs> um, another audience member asks if Slough House is inspired by a real place. Slough House is real. Can you excuse me, man? I must let I've got a cat crying outside the door and it's raining. It. Okay. Um Slough House is a real place in Virtue Commons. It's an actual building. The, the building was Slough House that I put my, my slow horses in. It's a building I used to walk past every day um, on my way uh, between the tube station and the office where I was working. And um, so that when I describe in the books where it is, that's where it is. And for a long time, I used to get uh, photographs sent to me um, by, by readers who said, is this, is this Slough House? And anytime anybody did that, they were always right. They always found the right, the right house. Oh. And if you see the TV show, when they show the exterior of the um, of Slough House, that's the building I'm talking about. The producers went the extra mile and they, they didn't have to do that, but they did. They got permission to use the actual block that I write about. And they changed a bit of it because the, the, um, the retail premises on the ground level are different. I invented the Chinese restaurant, so they put up a fake Chinese restaurant there. But the building, that's, that's Slough House. Oh, great. Gosh, that's super interesting. I'm glad that that audience member asked that. I'm going to squeeze in one more question and we've got a yeah. tiny bit more time. Lisa from Paris asks if we will see more of Catherine Standish. Uh, she's certainly in the opening chapter of the book I'm writing at the moment. The one that you're six pages into. Yeah. Excellent. Great. Well, that's good news. Um, sadly, we've run out of time, everybody, but I hope that we were able to answer some of your questions at least. Thank you for joining us tonight. If you don't already have a copy of The Secret Hours, it's out now and it is excellent. Um, Mick, thank you so much for coming on to talk. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you, Alison. Me too. And thank you for all your questions. I really enjoyed answering this. Thank you. It's a lot of fun. Uh, Guardian Live has much more coming up, including events with Grace Dent and Johnny Marr. To find out more, visit theguardian.live. We'd love to hear what you feel to this event, so do fill, in, fill out our survey at the end. And finally, another huge thanks to Mick. Good night. Good night.